start the hands-on portion. Okay, so we have this model. Some of you have built it yourselves. Some of you may want to get it from the Canvas sites uh, for the respective courses. Um, I'd like to elaborate this on a number of, of ways um, to build skills, but more deeply to build awareness. Um, uh, and I have a number of, of goals here. Um, I'd love to, to talk more, more generally um, to introduce uh, mobility or G, uh, GIS features or, or put in place uh, care seeking behavior and hybrid models. And you'll find many videos of me online doing exactly that on my channel. Um, but first things first, and I wanted to hit on some, some basics. Um, so uh, let's first take a look at uh, a key focus with, with all models, um, or almost all models, that um, has somehow been submerged here. So well, I'm going to share my screen and, and remind us of, of this model, and, and we saw it running earlier. And that's all well and good um, that we have this nice visual representation. Visual representations matter. They are useful for stakeholders. They're useful for modelers, useful for develop confidence that a model is working, for understanding the dynamics, understanding why we see the patterns that we do in the real world or why we're getting certain outcomes in a model. But there's a lot more that we often look to for models. And uh, for our fields course in CMPD 898, our focus lies in the intersection of data science and system science. So it befits us to think about collecting some statistics from this model, collecting some data of when we run the model to have certain outcomes. And right now, we have a lot of nice pretty pictures, but we don't have outcomes. The pretty pictures are not eye candy. They're important, um, but let's go get some quantitative outcomes, shall we not? Okay. so. Um, I'd like to walk through a few basics with respect to gathering these outcomes. First of all, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that if we go to Maine, it's important to remember where you are in a model at a given time. Here we're going to Maine because we're dealing with something that applies across the entire population, not just for a particular person, not just for our theory of personhood or our theory of personness characterized by this state chart, but uh, an issue with respect to Maine. We're going to count the number of people who um, are sick at any one time, who are infective in particular. Um, and uh, we will do so using this population, particularly if you click on that population in Maine and you go into the properties window on here and you scroll down, um, you'll find many characteristics, some of which we've spent time modifying, such as the initial number of agents set from that parameter or the sex distribution, such as people's X and Y locations. But beyond that, there's actually in this little accordion menu, this little thing called statistics. And if you, if you expand that, um, you'll find you could see it says no items defined yet. We're going to define one. We'll remedy that, okay? Um, so we're going to define some statistics that are calculated over this population in which we can interrogate, which we can, we can ask about over time to say, um, create some, some data on the evolving model situation. So I'm gonna say in the statistics area plus, and what I'm doing here is at a deeper level reflects the fact that agent-based models are about interaction of agents and interaction of agents with the environment. They're not about agents as atomistic entities that just exist in isolation. They're about their interactions. And often we collect statistics, not merely at the individual level, as important as that is, but at the overall level. So we're gonna do that for the population here. We did plus, and we're going to find um, count infectives, okay? And 
Does anyone want to pause it? If we want to count the number of infectives, what is the type of this going to be? Is it a max, a min, an average, a sum, or perhaps a count? Anyone? A what? It's a <laughs> it's some. It's a count. It's called count infectives. So it's a count. There's no there's no tricks here. Okay, it's a count. Just trying to get some liveness. Um Make sure people aren't asleep. Um, so at least I know one person is not asleep. So that's good. Um, so, so the question is, what are we going to count? Uh, and what we're going to count is the number of people. How would we determine that someone's infectious? Can anyone say? How would we determine that someone's infected? By the way, you can click, double click on a window here and call up a, a full screen view of it. Um, uh, double clicking on again, we'll put it back into a smaller screen. So if you want to kind of zoom in, you want to get a, your focus on that, uh, double clicking is a good thing. How would we tell if someone's infectious in this model? So if we have a given person, let's give them a name, um, uh, maybe um, item. Um, how do we tell if they're infectious? If item is infectious, what would we, what would we ask? Are they what? How do we know someone's infectious? We would say, are they in what? Hospital. Uh, okay, well, yeah, we, we could know if they're infectious if they're in the hospital, but there's a lot of people that may be infectious that are not in a hospital, particularly with Omicron um, and even yeah. with regular COVID-19. So how would we determine from what we've represented from this theory of personhood? How would we say someone's infectious? If they're uh, in what? In export. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, if they're in this state, the infectious state, um, we can say that, okay? So we're gonna go back here and we're going to say, we're going to in this statistic, okay? Um, in Maine here, uh, we were there defining this statistic uh, I was down in the statistics area. We'll say we're going to count the number of people. And you notice there's this little, little light bulb. And it says, call the agent item. Okay, that's going to sound a little bit weird. But item dot in state, okay, um, uh, you're going to ask, are they in a given state? And it's going to return a Boolean. It's going to return true or false. In case you didn't see that, when I was querying information about it, um, you notice if I go down to in state, it says, okay, give me a state name and I'll return true if basically if the agent's in that state, if, if the corresponding state chart in the agent is in that state. Okay. So that's what I want to do. I want to say, hey, are they in that state? Okay. Um, and what state is it? It is infectious. Now I'm going to try typing initially infectious. Um, and you notice it says it can't resolve infectious. That's because it doesn't know where to look for it. And so what we need to say is person.infectious. Maybe we have infectious mink or deer or or rats or what have you new york city has unsettling number of of uh of, of cases of mutated covid19 virus circulating in the sewers and quite a few researchers believe it's probably the rats the rats in the sewers have caught covid19 and they, like people, are using the sewers as sanitary disposal mechanisms, so to speak. Uh, and, and that's actually leading them to, to uh, give signs of, of the COVID-19 variant circulating in rats. And so there can be rat infectiousness and there can be person infectiousness in deer. So you have to say in-state person.infectious. 
it's infectiousness with respect to a person, okay? And I, I wish them weren't so, but that's kind of what we have to do here. And, and so, okay, it's gonna, it's gonna say, okay, um, I'm gonna count the number of people that are in this state, okay? Um, make sure if you push this, it builds successfully. Um, and notice there's no semicolon. You're not commanding it. You're just giving it a formula to test. So it's gonna count within the population, count the number of agents who are in the state person dot infectious. And that's infectiousness with respect to person. There it is. It stands before us, okay? Um, so that's the idea. We can run our model, run early, run often, ladies and gentlemen. Make sure your model runs uh, frequently to look for issues. The sooner you can find those issues, the clearer it will, will be what change you made that caused them. So here we see people proceeding in the population, but our attention, this is at an individual level, our attention is actually up here. Um, let's go to population here. And you can see, oh, now there's two count infectives. You notice it says count infectives here. This came from our statistic that we just created. Whenever we create a statistic in population, that's exactly what we did just now. We went in and we created a statistic down there. Um, it is reported out here um, as part of the routine information reported on that population. So that's nice. We, we, we have some information. That's, that's good. Um, not a bad thing. Well, let's, let's build on that strength uh, if we can. So first of all, let's go do something more than just gawk at it manually. So let's go to main. We'll go down main. Great. And what we're going to do above this area, we're going to add in a chart. Mm. We're going to add in a chart, which is going to plot out the number of infectious people over time. So how do we do that? Well, we're going to go here. We're going to go to the palette. Um, if you can't see the palette, remember you can enable or disable it through this menu. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to whoa, uh, we're going to go to analysis palette. Indeed, and we're going to drag in a time plot. Okay. Um, there it is, and there are properties of the time plot. Why this chose to put it up uh, at the very top of the screen, I'm not sure, but I, I just dragged it down. So here's a time plot. What did I do? I went, ladies and gentlemen, to the palette and made sure it was visible. I went down to analysis and I dragged in a time plot. And the time plot is going to summarize the state of the model at any one time. So remember, models like this give information out at an individual level, but also at the global level. And this is an example of global output. So I dragged in a time plot and now we have the characteristics by selecting it, the characteristics of the time plot here. What do I wanna put here? I'm gonna to wanna to put, um, I wanna put um, prevalence uh, time plot, okay? Um, uh, so be a time plot of the prevalence, okay, in terms of prevalent case count. And I'm going to plot out a value here, and I'm going to say um, count infectious, okay? Number of infective people. And the value I'm going to plot will be my population, so this dot population dot, indeed, dot count infectious, infectives. We call it count infectives, I guess. Um, I missed that. But if you go look at um, 
at our population down here, whatever you called it, it should be, you should be calling that. So if you scroll down here, it's called count infectives here. Okay. So I call within this plot, I am plotting out the number of infectives over time here. Um, it's prevalence time plot. And the value being plotted is this dot population dot count infectives. Okay. Um, and uh, this should be updated automatically. Uh, and I didn't change anything every one day. Um, for now, we'll leave these other settings. So let's go run that uh, if we can. Um, let me focus down on, on this. So we're going to run it. And what we'll see is a reflection of the evolving state of the model. It's a, um, it's a reflection of the number of infectious people here over time. And what we can see is that it's far from just the kind of uh, up, up, down, and then going to some equilibrium that we might expect through a deterministic model, a compartmental model. And in fact, it can, it can kind of oscillate uh, around here. You notice it actually uh, went down and sort of stayed around one or two people for a while. And it's quantized, right? At any one time, there's one person infected or two or three or four. And then it goes extinct and here it's staying extinct. Um, so from then on, it stays extinct. Okay, so, so that's kind of nice. Um, let's, um, let's go see if we could do something a little bit more, um, more useful with that data. Well, one thing we could do is we could want to output this, output it to a file, say. Um, now, within this package, there's several ways you might seek to output. So um, one thing is obviously you could take a graph of, uh, of this, but you'll notice up here, there's this little button that says copy here, okay? Um, and I'm going to go call up a spreadsheet here, okay? Um, we're going to be using this a little bit in coming coming minutes. And I'm going to paste in, and what you'll see is that it actually outputs the data. So how did I do that? It's in this little, little copy up here in the upper right. I paste in the data from that, okay? I press copy. That creates, uh, rep that creates uh, or gets a copy of the data that's currently being plotted, and I can plot it out. And that's kind of nice. And you know, I could paste this in um, to, and save it as a CSV file and read it into R. Um, there are mechanisms uh, for getting it a little bit more directly into R. I won't go into them here. Um, but uh, fundamentally, we, we can use this built-in mechanism and, and that's kind of nice, um, uh, but kind of depends on the vagaries of what's shown here right now. I'd like to show something a little bit more reliable than that. So let's go take a look at this. Um, firstly, mm, let's go, uh, we're gonna put in place what's called, you'll notice when I created this graph, it, it's just plotting this value out directly, count infective. It's calling count infectives using this as kind of a function called a method technically um, on the population and saying, hey, count the number of infectives right now. And periodically it does that. And that's great. Um, but I'd like to do something a little bit richer than that. I'd like to create a data set that then I could export. So in this same analysis palette, once you dragged, you dragged this uh, time plot, there's a thing called data set. I'd like you to drag in that data set 
to this very same main, okay? And this will be called um, count infectious data set. There we go, count infectious data set. How did I do that? I went into the palette. I went down to this analysis area, would have been open already. And I dragged into main, not person, but main, dragged in this data set. And that data set is, is its job in life is to hold things. OK. Um, so you'll notice that the initial selection says to whether to ask whether you use time as the horizontal axis value. And we will do that. But we're going to have the vertical axis value here is going to be, guess what? This dot population dot count infectives. That same thing which we were plotting in this, in this plot, we're going to call here and have it go into this data set over time. And we'll keep the latest thousand samples so it doesn't throw them away after 100. We'll keep the latest thousand. So in this data set, I called it, I dragged in a data set, I called it count infectious data set. I told it for the vertical axis value, use this dot population dot count infectives, begin paren, end paren. Uh, and then I, I said to keep a thousand samples. Now, um, I apologize, I realized uh, some of this may be hard for you to read. So I'm just going to uh, go and paste it into a framework where it's a little bit easier for you to read in case you want that. So remember the dot is kind of like an apostrophe. It's like my population, um, my population's count infectives. Um, I'm calling that, I'm, I'm saying, you know, uh, go call this and get back a value, just like we might call sine function or cosine or tangent or what have you. Um, so there we go, count effectives. Um, okay, so that's a data set. Uh, let's go run this model. Um, might as well build it first. Building is good, building is fun. Uh, building is something for everyone. So uh, I'd suggest that you go build it and just make sure it's happy that it says build completed successfully. At our boot camps, we have TAs running around to help you with this. Um, uh, but here, without that, hopefully that will still clue you in if there's a problem. Um, and you notice it's running here. We can go up to this data set and you see right now it's not actually recording data. It's, it's actually set up so that it can record data. It would know what to record, but we didn't tell it to update data automatically. And we need to do that. So what the key thing that you need to do, which I did not do, was say update data automatically here. So for this data set, uh, it should update data automatically. And it asks you, how often should I update? And it's every one day starting at time zero. So what did I do? I saw a count infectious data set wasn't recording information. I went into properties for it and I changed it to update data automatically. And um, it was doing it every day, every one days. There we go. Okay, let's go run this thing. Here we go. Um, we're going to, to get this going and and now we have, you notice this data set is recording information. It's squirreling it away uh, and uh, it's, it's doing so over uh, a longer period of time. So time passing, but it's storing it away. There it is. And once again, um, in a way less dependent on the vagaries of, of the uh, chart above, we can, um, we can go export this with this little thing here. And normally I can, I can go scroll this. I, um, um, I must be um, doing something unusual here because uh, normally I can scroll it. In any case, I can copy here 
and I can go over to my favorite, favorite spreadsheet and I can go paste it and I'll have output from the model that I could graph um, you know, per my, uh, per my preferences here in a, um, a spreadsheet or a, a statistical package of my choice, such as R. Okay, and I'll do that and it shows, shows a graph exported. Okay, that's kind of nice, um, but it's kind of manual still. Um, and, you know, often we want to not um, have it be manual. Um, we want it to be exported automatically um, rather than uh, uh, rather than going and uh, having to manually export it. Um, okay, so um, I'd like to teach you about another construct of agent-based modeling uh, that is a conceptual construct that extends beyond this particular package, but which will be useful for this package. And uh, it's something that this package calls an event. And you can find it under this ancient palette with an icon that looks like da Vinci's measure of man. Okay, there, there it is. Um, so if you click on that and you go to event and you drag it in, um, I will say um, export data set. Okay, um, I'm gonna call my event export data sets. Great. Um, and we will get it to export at the stop time uh, of the model, okay? Or, or at a fixed time. Uh, right now, the model runs ad infinitum. We're going to get it to stop at a, uh, at a particular time. Um, and uh, I will set it to, um, to go off at a, at a single time, whatever the stop time is for the model. Um, whatever that stop time is, so as long as there is one, uh, we could get it to go off there. Um, I, after I create this for you, I'll show there's another way. We could get it to, to fire off once. Um, we, we can get it to export from a different place if we want it to be able to do it without any stop time for the model. So I'm going to set both these scenarios here, big population and simulation. I'm going to scroll down and set them to stop at a certain time. I'm gonna stop them at time 100, okay? Here we go, stop time and stop time 100. Okay, great, great, stop time 100. Um, so now the model will run until time 100 and we'll finish. Uh, as Lewis Carroll said, it will start at the beginning, go to the end, and then stop. Um, so, uh, so here we have this uh, export data sets that we want to export at that stop time. So how do we do that? We got to export data sets. And we can do one of two things. One is fragile, one is robust, but takes a tiny bit more work. So one thing we could do is we could say, we want this event which represents an occurrence of a, in this case, an occurrence of a trigger. We want it to go off at a certain time. Mm. And what time do we want, at what time do we want it to go off? Want it to go off, let's say at time 100. This is kind of the easy cop out. It's easy, but it's fragile. It's risky because later we may change the, the stop time and we forget to change it here. Um, it's, it's fragile, we, uh, it can easily break. Um, and we could have you know, the model exporting data not at the final time. We'll come back to that in just a minute. But let's set it to be 100 times 100, divide our difficulties. Great. Mm. Okay, now, now we want it to, so that's great. Now we want it to actually do the work. Um, let's, let's actually go and, and get it to export, okay? So how are we going to do that? Well, 
if you go over here, you'll notice that in the palette, there's a bunch of choices. And one of them is called text file. And, sorry, one of them is called connectivity. And there's a thing called text file in it. There's also a database and an Excel file. And each of these uh, can serve very fruitful uses. Um, let's go to the very first, if we could. Um, sorry, not the first, the, the second, the text file. Okay. So in the palette, we have this te text file um, option, and we're going to drag that in. And because it's conceptually grouped here with exporting, I'll say, you know, um, uh, exported, uh, exported, uh, export file. Okay, um, something, something like that. F export file. Um, okay. Um, so it's a file for which we will um, output. Maybe I'll call it file output. Um, something like that. File output. Maybe that's that's better. Okay. So this is going to represent an output file. Um, and uh, we're going to get it to write to a file. Now, you notice right now, um, it doesn't have one listed. And in order to get it to, to output it to a file, we, we, we need to point it to one, it turns out. Um, so the easiest thing to do, the one that I find a little bit burdensome, but it's, it's not too bad, uh, is we're going to go over to your favorite spreadsheet. I'm going to create a new spreadsheet. And oh my gosh, um, I wanted a new spreadsheet, not a new text document, new spreadsheet. Thank you. Uh, and I want to say file save as, okay? And I'm going to put it in, uh, sure, I'll put it in uh, Mumble. Um, I'll put it in T at my TMP folder. Here we go. Uh, come on, get down here, TMP, boom. Um, great. So we're going to put it in temp and we will, uh, we will call it, so I can go wherever you want to put it. Um, maybe some of you will want to put a download. Some will want to put it in documents. I'm going to say, um, uh, you know, ABM SIR output dot CSV. Um, and uh, I will say the type of this is a CSV file. Now, whatever spreadsheet you're using, it'll be a little bit different. But the point is to create a file that's empty, um, that's an empty text file. You could do it from the command line if you'd like to. You could do it from a text editor. You could do it from this. Um, I'm not going to police those. I just happened to have that open. So I said, sure, go do that. OK, so now we have this CSV file that's uh, created. I know where it is, and I can go point it to that. The goal is to create kind of a shell of a file, something that exists, but it's empty. Okay, great. I'm gonna close this, this guy. And now I'm gonna go back to here to any logic and the file output. I'm going to click this dot, 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 and I will find it. Oh, look at that. And it, it found, found it. Okay. Um, and I said, okay, go put it here. So it did dot, 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 and I said, put it here, okay? Um, I'm actually, uh, yes, uh, you notice that it requires us to kind of point to an existing file. I, I, I don't think there's a way we can just type in a name here and it will automatically sort of know about it. I think we have to point it to some text file. Okay, um, and make sure this is in write mode. Okay, so that's the most painful aspect of this. Okay, yeah, you gotta go create this shell file and point it to it. That only has to be done once when you're adding this. Point it to it, one and done, and then you can go on.
Great. Okay. Um, and now in export data sets, we need it to, to actually export. Um, export data sets is set so at time 100 days, it's going to export. And what will it export? Well, it'll export to this file output. Okay, great. So what we're going to say is uh, a tab between them. That's that backslash T is the tab. So uh, if, if you're to treat it all as a tab delimited file, you just, uh, you just have this as your text. This would mean put a tab between these two things. Okay. So that's output some um, I'll put some files to a, some some data to a file. Great. Um, okay, so that was one of the tasks uh, I wanted to take on. But I wanted to do something that was a little bit more interesting than that um, together. Uh, those things are important. Be able to create graphs, create statistics, be able to output outside of any logic. Um, all these things are important, but there's more interesting things yet. One thing that we haven't seen is, um, is uh, how to do something other than a summary of the current state. Suppose, for example, we wanted to keep track of how many people are being infected per week um, within this model. Right now, we have a way through that statistic of counting the number right now that are, that are infectious right here. Um, uh, so, sorry, it's in the population. The number that are infectious, that's what our statistic was. Um, and we could add statistics that will sum up um, uh, the number of meeting some criteria um, or sum up some values, uh, sorry, sum up some values, take an average, uh, min and max, et cetera. But, uh, Maybe um, maybe we want to do something a little bit more interesting, like record the number um, that are newly infected each day. Well, before we do that, maybe I'll show how to do the fractional prevalence. So I'm going to add a, uh, a new statistic here that will be fractional prevalence. And this is going to be, it might surprise you, an average. And it's going to be an average over some, some um, expression, um, some formula. And what is the formula going to be? Well, we'll, we'll make it a one if they're infectious and a zero otherwise. And we'll take the average over that population. So if they are in a state of infectiousness, we'll use a question mark. We'll give it a one, else we'll give it a zero. So it, this, by taking the average, I would argue, over the population of this expression, treating people who are infectious as one, treating people who are not infectious as zero, we'll be able to get a fractional prevalence of infection, um, the fraction of the population that's infected at any one time. Let's go run that. Um, so, uh, uh, you notice I'll put it up on the big screen here in case you want to see it. There's no semicolon at the end. This is not a command. It's determining a value. So there's no semicolon. Um, the, remember, this is expression like an if then. If this is true, then you know we will use this value. Otherwise, that's what the colon means. We'll use this value. I'm going to build this. There we go. And I'm going to run it. Here we go. Okay, um, and we will run it. And you notice that if I go and I look at this, um, mm, uh, if I go and I look at the population here, um, hey, come on, um, uh, then it'll give me a fractional prevalence of 13, 13 out of 100 agents, therefore 0.13 rather is the fractional prevalence. Okay, so we just added another statistic. That's kind of nice. Um, but let's go, 
let's go uh, put in place a, um, a statistic which is going to count the number of new infections over each day um, instead of the number that are infected right now. So how are we going to do that? Well, um, maybe for flexibility, we'll do it every week. Um, we'll have the number of infections that, that occur on a weekly basis, great. Um, so how do we do that? Uh, well, what we could do is we could take our running tally. Uh, at the beginning of every week, we set that tally to zero. And then for each new person getting infected, we'll tally up one person. Boom, 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 boom. And we'll count each person that gets infected. And then at the end of the week, we'll report out the number for that week. Um, and that will let us keep track of, of how many got infected for the week. And reflecting it's the start of a new week, we'll zero out the tally. And it'll be a running tally or rise by the week, and then it'll go back to zero at the beginning of the next week. This sounds like a nice idea, and it will point to a, a common mechanism here, which is, again, the use of events. So, so we're going to go into the, the agent palette, and we're going to call into main. Why main? Because we're computing statistics over the entire population. It's going to be an event, okay? An event. Ooh. And this event is going to be um, weekly, um, uh, record weekly incidents. Okay, great. So it's going to keep track of the number of gut people that have gotten infected per week. Okay, it's an event, um, but it's a different event. Than our, than our last one, or than this initial infection. Um, each of these ones were set to go off once. You notice it says mode occur once. Mode occurs once. This one is going to be sent to go off cyclically. Mm. It's going to go off cyclically. It's part of a cyclic scheme. It'll be going off periodically. Um, the first occurrence time uh, will be at time zero. Um, okay, that, that's kind of fine. Uh, that doesn't seem unreasonable. We'll always have zero running tally till then. And then it will be, um, it will go off weekly, okay? Um, maybe we'll set it the first time to go off um, one week in. So the first one we get will be the first week, not, not at time zero. So I'm setting the first occurrence time to be one week. Um, and I apologize, this is not so visible. One week here, oh, come on. Um, uh, one week, that's a one. Um, and, uh, and then the recurrence time will be one as well, one week. Every week it will go off and the first one will be at just one weekend. Um, uh, okay, um, so here we go. Um, uh, and what are we going to do here? Well, hmm, we we said we're going to have a a running tally, so we got to set up some sort of tally, some sort of count of the number that have been infected. So to add this, we're going to add a, a different type of construct. We're going to add a variable. And this variable is going to be called count um, um, uh, incident incident cases, okay? Um, or or uh, count um, yeah, count um, you could call it maybe some people call it new cases. PHEC often uses the term kind of new. Um, and once um, count new cases, fine. Um, it's going to be an integer, not a double precision number. It's not a, like a real number, it's an integer, okay? So I, how did I do that? I added a variable from the agent palette and it's gonna be called, and it's gonna be count new cases. 
and it's going to be an int, and its initial value will be zero. It's going to start empty. No, no cases. Great. And then when we record the weekly incidents, we're going to we're going to record this. We're going to put it into a tally that we're of which we're we're keeping track. Great. What is this tally? Well, to do that, we use a data set. Okay, great. Um, so so let's go add a data set in. A data set lives in the analysis palette. We're going to go add a data set. And this is going to be called um, weekly. Um, uh, uh, it's going to be called weekly um, uh, cases. Okay. We'll call it weekly cases. W E E K, not E A K. Weekly cases. And it's a data set. Um, now, this time, um, we're going to be putting data into it, not automatically, but just by design. So for this weekly cases, we're going to say, do not update automatically. OK? Um, uh, we're, we're not going to update it automatically. Um, and uh, we're also not going to log it to the database, but um, uh, but it's not actually on anyway right now. So this weekly cases is going to um, it's going to be uh, a data set that's going to keep track of the number of new infections um, that have occurred in the past week. Okay. Um, and it's only going to be recorded at certain times. Um, and uh, here, uh, for the horizontal axis value, I'm not going to use time. I'm actually going to use a, um, a, a, different, uh, a different value. And we'll, uh, we'll tell it what to use when we put the data into it. OK, um, great. Um, so uh, that's good. Um, it's it's kind of a a nice uh, nice thing. Um, we have a place to for that data to go, and this record weekly incidents. That it's when it goes off, it'll have to put the data into weekly cases. By the way, really, I should call this um, weekly cases data set just to make sure. It's clear in our mind, this is a data set. It's not a variable of another sort, it's a data set. Great, and record weekly incidents. Its job in life will be to go off at week, gosh, it should have been week one. I could have sworn I put it to week one. And then every subsequent week, um, it'll go off. Great. And then the action of it will be twofold. First of all, it will add this value to the weekly cases data set. OK, great. Um, and I'd kind of like to add it with the current week. Mm. Um, uh, so that, that would be kind of a, a, a nice, uh, nice thing to do. OK, um, so here I'm going to say, for the action associated with this record weekly incidents, I'm going to say weekly cases data set. Um, and we're going to say dot add, okay? Um, and we're gonna add an X and a Y value. The X value is gonna be the current week. Mm. Um, and, um, how are we going to do that? Well, we'll do the current time mm, um, uh, as uh, a week. Um, um, and a way to do that is if you say multiply it by week, this will be saying the time as a week. So um, it's, uh, 
it's actually going to be converting the time unit. And I think you'll be in the right direction. We'll, we'll double check that. It could be we have to divide by, uh, divide by it. But um, in fact, I, um, uh, I'd have to double check this. But um, uh, it's, uh, uh, OK, I'm just going to say uh, time divided by 7.0. So it's time is in days. And divided by seven will give the number of weeks. Great. And the other value that I'm going to put here is count new cases. That's the running total that we've had. For each case, there'll be uh, an increment of this. And so this is going to hold over the entire week till this point. When this event fires at the end of a week, um, uh, this count new cases will hold the number of cases that have transpired, that have occurred, that have precipitated. Uh, over this last week. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to zero out count new cases, set it to zero. Um, set it to zero. There we go. Um, so count new cases is an integer. Um, uh, periodically, every week, this event will fire. It will record to this data set the current time and weeks and the count of new cases. Um, that's the running total. And then we'll zero that out. And that's nice. Um, but there's one key thing we haven't done yet, which is to, to treat it as a tally. What do we have to do to treat it as a tally? Well, um, it's quite nice. Um, we just uh, have to record when a given person is infected. Where are a person's, like, how can we see when a person is infected in this model? Where would we go? to find uh, a person being infected. Anyone? Where do we go in the model if we want to see where a person gets infected? Anyone? Oh, I, I see a chat. Here we go. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, OK, no one's answered my question, though. Um, where would we go to see someone infected in the model? Where are people getting infected? It's in what? What place in the model? Begins with P, ends with N, has an S in the middle, an R before the S, an E before the R, an O after the S, and before the N. It's in person. Person, infection. It's in person. It's in person. Thank you. Thank you. It's in person. Um, so, so look, this is where they get infected right there. That's where they get infected. That's, that's where infection happens. They're going from susceptible to exposed and exposed is the state of latent infection. So what we do got to do here is, ah, now the, now the, this whole dot thing is becoming clear. We do main dot and remember what the variable's name is, count new cases. So we do main here uh, in person, associated with this, we do main dot count new cases equals count new cases plus one. Now, um, this is a bit wordy. And those of us who, um, use Java code a lot um, or, or do a lot of programming, like to put it in a very brief way. There's actually two brief ways we, we could put it. They'd be a lot briefer than this. Um, so you could put it this way if you want to. If that's much clearer to you, that's fine. Another way we could put it is plus equals one. And that communicates, you know, it's the, it's this thing gets incremented by one. Another even terser way to put it, by the way, this needs semicolons after that. The, the tersest way to put it is plus plus, meaning it, it gets incremented by one. Um, take your pick, um, whatever, whatever like you like. Um, uh, if you feel more comfortable with this, uh, you can do that. Um, if you feel more comfortable with this first one, you can do this. Yes, yes, question. 
so why are we doing it to exposure if we're counting infectious? Should we're we... not counting infectious. We're counting infectives. Infectives. People... Okay, I see. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. People who are infected. Um, so uh, we're counting new infections that occurred. Very good question, but it's new infections that occur. And this is where a new infection occurs. This is where someone becomes infectious. And you could record that alternatively. I'm recording when people get infected in the first place. And that's what that is. That, that was my intention. But admittedly, when I said cases, maybe that wasn't clear. Probably there should have been count new infections, okay? And maybe that would be clear with them. So thank you for the question. Very good question. Any other question here? Okay, great. Okay, so let's run this model now. Um, and what we should see is this data set accumulating the count of people infected over the time. You notice that right now, it's before, okay, now it has one sample. Two people got infected that first week. And now it's running up, well, now it should be seven people that next week, okay? And then three people the next week. And then five, six, four, et cetera. Um, and, you know, we could go and, and look at it uh, here and looks like we've run it uh, entirely. Remember, you could copy this and paste it if you wanted to do so, or through the same mechanism we used here um, of exporting data sets, we could export this as well. I won't go through that. Okay, now that's, that's nice, but, but remember I, 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 I sat here and argued before you that agent-based modeling in my preface remarks that agent-based modeling is particularly interesting because we can keep track of individual trajectories, people's progression at an individual level. Um, and aggregate modeling as well, we can compute totals over the population and that's great and that's important. But a certain type of total is of particular interest. A certain type of summary statistic is something we can't effectively get through compartmental modeling, through aggregate modeling. And that is, statistics involving people's longitudinal history. So what we're going to look at actually is taking a look at how many times, and we're gonna look at an individual level statistic, but summarize it over the population. It's going to keep track of a person's history over time, but we're gonna summarize a, a, a summary statistic on that history, which we just wouldn't be able to, re, uh, to reasonably characterize using an aggregate model. Specifically, for simplicity, we're going to record the number of times they've gotten infected for each person. So um, to record the number of times they've gotten infected, we could again go here. And we, we know how to record now the number of times they've gotten infected. Um, uh, or, or we know how to record when infection occurs. That's what we just did. We tallied this up. We reported back to Maine to the mothership that you know one more infection has occurred. We could keep track at an individual level how many times this particular person has gotten infected in a similar notion. We could in fact record when they got infected, who infected them, where they were infected geographically you know, through what network connection. We could record how long it took them to, to lose immunity or how long ago they lost immunity, how long ago they were vaccinated. These all raise really uh, valuable possibilities at an individual based model that are really hard to capture at an aggregate level. Um, we could have statistics in the model about people's probability of getting infected following different lengths of time after being vaccinated and compare it to real world statistics on the same. Uh, or compare the number of times people have been reported as cases, a given person is reported as case, compared against comparable statistics from the world. Let's go see how we can do that. Um, so it doesn't require much mechanism at all. In fact, it's, 
It's quite parsimonious. Um, one might even say sparsimonious. So here, within person, we go to the agent palette and we're going to drag in variable. There we go. And this variable is going to be count times infected. So it's going to count up the number of times they've been infected. And what sort of variable, what sort of type do you think this has? Is it a double? Is it a, is it a sex? Is it a color? What sort of thing do you think it is? Anyone? Is it a Boolean? Count times infected. It's an, anyone? <laughs> it's an integer. You speak with good reason. Um, okay, so it's an integer. Uh, it's an int, and its initial value will be zero. There we go. Great. Um, exposure here is going to do what to this integer? Anyone? I welcome the same stentorian voice to speak up. It is going to do what? Each time they get infected, this variable will need to do what? B begins with I, be increased or incremented. It needs to be incremented by one. Before, each time this person got affected, we said, hey, the tally of the total number of people being affected is one bigger. And that's good, but we just need to do something here. So this dot count times infected plus equals one. Same, same thing. Now, you notice that for those not familiar with Java, like this is saying, hey, count new cases, which lives in mains. Mains count new cases needs to be increased by one. That's because it was main that keeps track of the count of new cases across the entire population. But this time, count times infected, that lives in person. That's their particular count of times infected. So we're incrementing that by one as well. We'll keep a track, not just of the total number that got infected, but the number of times this particular person has got an infected. Yeah, okay. And by the same token, we could record the time of that infection, for example, how long they've been infected. We could, we could have a running history of this person, right? When they got infected, by whom, what context, um, how long it took them to recover, did they go to the hospital, whatever and keep the keep on running total of their biography, as it were, and compare it against similar biographies from real uh, real cases in the world. Um, okay, so so this is nice. Um, this is good. Um, so I'm gonna build this. I mean, the mechanism is there. Um, and I'm going to simulate this now. Great. Um, and we should go see at an individual level here, um, beyond this kind of count, of count of new cases, which is going to be rising here over time, or you know the number of new cases per week. If we go down to an individual level, if we go over here, we expand this, there we go, and we go down to an individual level, we can see that each individual keeps track of the count of times they have been infected. And this person, for example, has gotten infected once. Um, and let's go look at other people. Here's another person. This person has been infected once again. This person also. We're kind of browsing through up oh, that person zero times. That person remained uninfected. Um, here's one. And perhaps in here somewhere, there'll be someone who is infected more than once. I don't actually see one here. If we had the big population and we were to run this, you might well see that because there the infection is going to sit around. Uh, it's gonna be more persistent. It won't die out with uh, quite, as much, um, uh, quite as much speed. And there we might get uh, some people infected. Uh, sorry, uh, we yes. can't see. Oh, you can't see my screen. I, yeah. I stand corrected. In fact, I sit corrected. Okay, so there we go. Um, so uh, what did I do? I just ran, okay. Um, 
Did you see me add count time infected? Was that visible to you earlier when I added this? Was my screen visible? Anyone? Yes. yes. Okay, okay. So if I'm running the population now, the big population, um, uh, this will allow us to, uh, to simulate a, a much larger population. I'm sorry, um, I shouldn't have pressed that button, this button. That, that enables virtual mode to go as quick as possible. And what I was just looking down is, you know, the, uh, for people in this population, and we might get someone who is infected more than once because it kind of bounces around. But within the time frame we're seeing, maybe it happens rarely. Uh, in any case, we can now keep track of the number of times someone's exposed. Um, uh, that's good. Um, uh, we, we might want to report that. Um, we might want to have a um, histogram, for example, whereby we report that. Um, that's easily done. And in fact, you'll find videos of me doing exactly that. But time is limited. And I'd like to finish up within 15 minutes here. Um, so I'm going to give you a choice. Um, um, right. Well, I, I think actually um, it will be better to use our time. I, I, I could potentially uh, point you to a video for the histogram of those um, to show how many times people have been infected, different count of cases. But I'd like to, like to um, uh, expand your knowledge of state charts a bit in two dimensions. Number one, and I'm going to save this now as version two of the model. Um, if anyone would like to, to kind of uh, follow along here, um, I will go post this. Um, if anyone's having, having trouble um, recreating this, I'm going to post it to the course site and uh, hopefully that will allow people to, uh, to, who are having any sort of trouble to use the updated model that I've just produced. There we go. I should have called that a different version. Okay, so uh, let's go. Um, let's go uh, now and continue on to, to expand our knowledge of state charts. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my screen again. And let's go to this uh, depiction of an individual. We can use state charts at a global level. You could use them to represent the change in seasons, for example, in the global environment, or we can use them at an individual level. They're most common at an individual level. Um, um, but what you see here is, is fairly, um, it's not deterministic. There's stochastics as to when people recover or, or lose immunity, um, excuse me, when, when they uh, complete their latency or, or uh, lose their immunity. But what we don't have is um, stochastics and whether or not they get infected. If someone infects another, they definitively get infected. Um, and you may want to have greater repertoire than that to reflect, say, the occurrence of mask wearing or other uh, investments, you know, better filtration or ventilation to lower the risk someone gets infected if exposed. So we're gonna change this transition into a uh, probabilistic transition with a catch. So um, we're going to um, just, extracted from there, it was green here, and I bring it up. And we're going to go to our palette, the agent palette again, and we're going to add in a branch here, okay? Um, there we go. Um, and this branch is gonna reflect a conditional transition. So there's gonna be one transition from this branch to this kind of uncertainty diamond onto exposed. That's gonna reflect actual transmission of infection. And by contrast, there's gonna be one back to susceptible. And this is gonna reflect um, 
a case where transmission where exposure took place, but transmission did not. And I'll move this up here. I'm going to call this transition transmission, and I'll show the name. And uh, I will call this one um, no transmission. You notice when we set this up, one of these gets set as the default um, if all conditions are false. And the others are conditional. So I'm going to set this to conditional. Okay. And for now, um, we're going to set this to, um, to, to have a certain probability of being true. Where will that probability be set? Well, I'm going to set it in main in a parameter. Okay. So let's go up to main and let's add another parameter. And this parameter, the job of this parameter in life will be to, um, to do the probability, uh, probability, uh, probability of transmission. Okay. And I could say per discordant contact, per contact between an effective and a susceptible, but uh, I want to avoid being too wordy. So I'm going to say probability of transmission, and I'll make it for now an even 0. 0.5. What, what value it has depends on how we want to define contact, you know, but um, I'm, I'm going to give it a kind of thought piece value here, a placeholder value of 0. 0.5. That's the probability of transmission per contact between a susceptible and an, expo and, and an infected. Okay, um, so that lives in main because it's gonna be shared by all agents. It's not gonna be unlike uh, someone's uh, sex, it's not gonna vary by agent. Rather, it's gonna be shared by all agents. And so this transition, its condition is going to be main dot, because we're asking about something that lives in Maine, probability, there we go, of transmission. Mm. So, but the condition here is going to be something called random true. This is going to flip a coin with this probability. Okay, there it is. It's going to flip a coin that is this probability of, of landing up true. Um, that's why it's random true. Is it true? Um, and it's going to return true with, with this probability. Uh, again, main, because probability of transmission is a parameter that we put in main. And each person knows about the main in which they are embedded. They remember the main. Okay. And um, uh, transmission here is going to be set on that transition. So if they flip this coin with this probability of transmission, and it's true, they will go on to expose. Otherwise, uh, by default, you notice it says default if all of their conditions are false, they will stay insusceptible. Now, that's all nice and good, but there's a fly in the ointment here. Um, and if we had more time, I would ask you about the nature of that fly, uh, but time is, is running short. So I'll, I'll just tell you, at the initial start of the, of the simulation, we want someone, some index person to start infected. And how are we going to guarantee that? Well, we're going to have a transition from a different transition from susceptible to exposed that's going to force uh, transmission. Um, uh, that's one way to do it. Um, another way would be to kind of pick and designate someone at the very start and have them start in this state. And, and that can be done, but that requires also a bit of mechanism. It's kind of pick your poison. I think the easiest way and the most instructive way is probably going to be to, to, to have a, a, a separate transition that's going to be for the first person only force transmission, okay? And um, how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to place another transition from susceptible to exposed. 
and this is going to be called force in, in initial infection, okay? Um, and it's going to be a message transition. And uh, it's going to be one which will be triggered by a particular message, okay? Um, so now we're going to distinguish between different types of messages. This is very important. If we have a model that is hep C transmission and HIV transmission, or if we had a model that had flu and COVID-19, or if we had a model that had chlamydia and gonorrhea, um, we'd, we'd want to keep track, you know, which is infection occurring for one versus for the other. So in general, well, I kind of rested on our laurels and just kind of said, well, you know, this occurs for some message unconditionally and generally want to distinguish. And so we're going to go back and add our old friend, our friend that we added in our last session, the option list. We're going to add a new option list and it's going to be called messages. Oh, I called it message, Miss Ags, but it's going to be messages. And we're going to have one message called force initial infection. And we're going to have another one called, um, uh, it's going to be called exposure. Uh, I call it exposure because it, it doesn't necessarily infect the person who receives it. Force initial infection will. Everyone starts susceptible right now. Uh, we could divide everyone up using a conditional transmission uh, transition at the start, but right now everyone starts susceptible. Exposure might fall on someone who's, who's in fact not, not susceptible, in which case it might be ignored. So it's not quite accurate to call it uh, infection. So what did I do? I went to my model. I added a option list called messages, and then in messages, I typed in this and I typed in that. Notice if it, if it doesn't let you type in, you can use this plus down at the bottom. The plus is your friend, okay? And it can add, it can add in additional categories. But in this case, I don't, I don't want to. It's just, I noticed last time that someone was struggling with that or was, and was asking for help with that. And this will add in additional lines if you need them. Great. So now we have two messages. Okay. Um, in general, a very useful thing to have. Um, so um, let's, let's finish the thought, this chunk of work. So let's go to infectious. And instead of infectious, just sending any message, well, they send the exposed message. I'm going to have them instead send a message called exposed, exposed, boom. Um, that's a defined message. It won't be dependent on my vagaries of whether I capitalize it, um, you know, forget to capitalize it properly, whether it will get ignored. It's just a canonical name. It's, it's a symbol, oh, not exponential. Exposed, exposed. There we go. Um, so that's when one person exposes another it'll be sending this message exposed. Oh, it's exposure. Oh my gosh. Um, it should not be exposed. Sorry, exposure. Um, exposed is the name of this state. Man, I've got to check that. Um, exposure. Mm. Um, and meanwhile, this transition will only be triggered if we get the message exposure. Mm. Um, this transition is, is specific for kind of normal exposure. Uh, that's when someone will flip the coin and see if they're infected. By contrast, this transition is going to occur if we get the message force initial infection. Okay, that's what this is. Uh, okay, so it's going to be on the particular message force initial infection. Um, and we need to spell this correct. There we go. Okay. So I'm putting it in the big thing here. Okay. 
Um, but remember, autocomplete is your friend. You can start to say F-O-R-C-E -R and then just fill it out. Um, and it's the capitalized one you want, not the lowercase. OK, um, so, so that's, uh, that's nice. Um, the final thing we want to do is infect the initial person. That occurred over in Maine. There we are. Um, in Maine, and it occurred in the initial infection. So there we go, initial infection. It is going to be, we said delivered to random agent inside and we want it to be ex, uh, force initial infection. Okay, um, hey, come on. Um, force uh, initial infection. Um, okay, why, why won't you cooperate? Yeah, fine. So where was this? I went to Maine. I went to find where it infected a person initially. That's where this is. At time zero, the model says, you, you sir, are infected. At time zero, it occurs once. It'll send to a random agent, you are infected. That person will, because all persons start susceptible right now, they'll be starting here. They'll receive this message. And it will say force initial infection. It will take them down this route. They will say, yes, sir. And they will get infected and go to the exposed state. But later others will be, will be exposed. They will come via this route and they'll either be infected and it'll be transmitted or they'll go back to the susceptible state um, uh, with, with you know, that, the other thing being the possibility um, there. Okay, so, so let's run this. Um, uh, if we run this, uh, you might wanna build it first, but um, let's run it. And you'll notice the infection is occurring as before. Um, uh, but now it's occurring and it's spreading less. It's spreading less because people have only a 50% chance on average of getting infected uh, if exposed. So um, those numbers that you saw before, um, the, the number of people getting infected is now smaller. Um, it, the, the attack rate is smaller. Um, it's a lower cumulative attack rate and uh, it has a greater chance of dying out in fact. Um, okay, so um, I know that was a lot of sound and fury, um, but what I wanna communicate here is what we added is two different routes of exposure, two different types of exposure. And it shouldn't be lost that, the, the emphasis shouldn't be lost that the same basic mechanism could be used to capture exposure to flu versus exposure to COVID-19. Could be used to capture exposure to gonorrhea compared to chlamydia, um, to, you know, one, uh, one form of bloodborne uh, illness, hep C versus uh, HIV AIDS, um, HIV infection. So, so um, what we've done is added a general mechanism to allow our, our message transitions, our asynchronous advances, which occur, they're triggered by another thing in the model uh, to be affected by, um, by different types of, of messages. Um, so, so that's nice. Um, uh, now, uh, I've been, you know, I, I've uh, been taking your attention and, uh, and speaking now for, for two hours. Uh, my next plan was to add another state chart. Um, I was going to simulate the occurrence of mask use um, and have mask use affect um, the likelihood of transmission. It would actually affect the probability of getting infected and the probability of infecting someone else. It would reduce it um, in both directions. My having a mask means you're less likely to get infected, but you're having a mask also conditional on being exposed by me makes you less likely to be affected. If we're both wearing masks, this is kind of double reduction from mask, from mask wearing that's been under elucidated um, in, in some of the examinations. Uh, so I was going to 
have another state chart and have interacting state charts where we'd have mass skews and mass skews would, would couple to the dynamics here. And mass skews might um, have a social norm associated with it, which would spread. Um, that would take, you know, probably all told uh, half an hour to an hour uh, to do. We'd have a second state chart for everyone. In addition to having a certain state being in a, a specific state with respect to infection status, they would now be in a specific state with respect to mask attitude and use, reliability of mask use or, or current mask use. And um, they'd be uh, dynamics um, by which they're coupled together. Um, we don't have time to do that today. Um, if there were widespread interest in that, um, I could uh, I could walk you through that in a in a third tutorial here, but um, for now um, I'd like to remind you um, that beyond reviewing what we did last time, we built up um, some understanding and skills. We examined how uh, within these models we uh, we have statistics which are readily available at an aggregate level, even though the models are articulated um, at a level that allows us to reason about individual perception and behavior, knowledge, attitudes, beliefs. Um, but we also saw that with similar mechanisms, we could keep track of, of individual level, aspects of individual level history, such as the kind of times they've been infected or how long they've been infected or how long it's been since their immunity waned, et cetera time since last vaccination, how many times they've been vaccinated, what's their vaccination history. These are important, uh, imp important characteristics not to be minimized. Um, beyond that though, we saw how we could um, use statistics in a declarative fashion at the aggregate level, um, at the population level to summarize things about the population, such as the number of infectives, or indeed the fractional prevalence of infection in the population. Um, we further saw how we could record longitudinal measures like the weekly incidence, the number of people getting infected per week. It wasn't quite as built in as nicely as these cross-sectional summaries, such as the current count of infectives or fractional prevalence, but it allowed us to, to neatly capture um, people getting infected over time. Um, and uh, we, we recorded, say, weekly data sets. We also saw how we could export data, say, to an external file. And after a long song and dance, we found that it, it actually was indeed as easy as I remembered. I just had to remember that it was exported with a, a tab separator rather than a, a CSV. And I, I stand uh, uh, corrected for saying that this was a... Um, file output was a CSV. It should have been named .tab or .txt. Um, uh, and uh, finally, we saw how we could use different messages to distinguish different types of interactions, in this case, between agents. Um, uh, the main agent to the initial agent to be infected or agents to each other. And that allows great flexibility because it allows us to reason with multiple conditions. We can have different types of messages germane to different conditions and different state charts um, as we capture them here. Um, I did also note that even things like uh, this timeout transition, which seems so rigid, can be, uh, can be uh, triggered uh, based on a timeout that's actually computed at the time they come into the state. So if you have someone with a weaker immune system, they might stay infectious for longer, but for a defined time drawn from a distribution than someone who, is, uh, who has a, a stronger immune complement. Um, uh, so those were some of the uh, themes from today. I hope that's useful. I will post uh, these models. Um, and uh, if there is uh, notable interest I can give a, uh, a third um, tutorial, which uh, might look at changing network types, um, 
It would look at, uh, I think, creating histograms. And most importantly, would look at interacting state charts and having these different aspects of evolution captured for a given person within the population. Um, uh, we could also potentially, as time allows, look at mobility, people's moving around between different contexts um, and or uh, look at uh, care seeking, where they present for care in a care environment characterized by, uh, by discrete event simulation. Anyway, so those are some comments um, and a, a bit of additional exposure to agent-based modeling. It's good and it's bad and it's ugly. Um, so hopefully um, those are, are useful tools that will equip anyone interested in age-based modeling for thinking a little bit more broadly about those models. And uh, please do let me know if you would like a, uh, a third tutorial on the sort of topics that I discussed and uh, I should be able to, to carve out one um, in, in the next week or two um, to, to sort of round out some aspects of, of your exposure. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good to be with you. And I think with those comments, I will rest. And uh, I wish you the very best of your, your break week and look forward to, uh, to interacting with you this week. I am working on some things for the class this week and we'll be updating some slides um, and preparing uh, for our next take-home exercise uh, involving R. Thanks very much. Take care there.